I'm going to talk about um, automatic program analysis, and especially now, kind of all the topic a, a bit hung up on this uh, uh, old bug in SendMail. It's I think from 2003, so it's really an old one, um, and showing how I mean it got famous because uh, well it was exploitable first of all remote exploit, but also because uh, Halva Halva Flake got interested into it made a smaller version out of it and show, or tried to show that uh, automatic static analysis tools are having a hard time to find this bug that was found manually. And uh, I'm gonna well, discuss the bug, I'm gonna show uh, how our tool does with it, with it, and I'm gonna show comparison of other tools, how they, um, how they fare on, on this. And um, so, for example, the, the, the name email address you see there is as possible string that was an exploit. So basically, if you send an email address with lots of uh, brackets open, then you could overflow the buffer and you could uh, insert code into send mail. That was kind of then the important thing. So a bit of a history: the buffer, uh, the bug was discovered by Mark Dowd, 2003, and it's um, about this parsing loop in send mail about 500 lines of code that parses the email address and tries to repair it in a way. Kind of the parser is trying to be smarter than, than basically it, it tries to match um, brackets and make it kind of uh, perform it uh, better if it's broken. And then, like I said, in about 2011, Harva Flake, um, he looked at the problem and, and somehow was well disappointed with the state of, of automatic analysis tools and extracted a much smaller version, about 50 lines of code, and said that, look, guys, if, you, if your tool can show that the, on the buggy version it, it can find the bug, but also it can show on the fixed version that there is no bug, then kind of that's, that was his challenge. And at that time, or uh, let's say till last year, or uh, no tool could show it, of course, the point is that uh, not everybody tried it out, the challenge. But um, it's been a uh, topic of various talks at conferences and even some paper, the, the bug itself, and how some tools try to, to uh, analyze this problem. And um, the presented solution so far always required some manual um, additions from the user. So basically, the tool is not just given the program and spits out the result, but needs some tweaking by the tool user. And uh, again, a bit of backstory. So uh, we were working in the beginning, doing my PhD with Halva Flake together, and uh, well, every time we met, we showed a bit what we proceeded, and we were thinking on some, uh, doing something together, but he got, uh, well, to the point that it's nice what you do, but show me at least that your tool is able to, do, to solve this one challenge. And um, we looked at it briefly and realized that, okay, it's, our tool is not able to do that. And... Um, Last year, I just finished my PhD, and then somehow we were about to meet again for a workshop with Halvar, and was thinking, okay, let's give it a try. Why not? I mean, we improved since then, since the beginning, and it suddenly worked, surprisingly. Um, and it took me a while to find out why. I mean, looking into the details of the analysis, but it was nice to see that it worked. And um, let's now go to the bug itself. So I hope after lunch, everybody's still able to read some code. Um, so I'll show a bit simplified version after, uh, after that of, uh, of it. But the main thing is that you see this while loop in the middle that does the parsing. It reads one character at a time from the input and writes it to a local buffer on the stack. And with this if else, uh, with the if clauses, it basically tries to find out if there's some braces and then it manages some state in some uh, Boolean variables, this quotation and round code variables, and then it um, increments or decrements this upper limit pointer for the local buffer. So basically, it kind of tries to, to manage some pointers, and in this inner state machine, it tries to do this, what I meant before. It tries to repair the email address if it's somehow in a weird format. It's very simple. I mean, the original code is more complex, but this is now the simplified version from Halvar. And, um, Basically, the problem is this red line, so this upper limit minus minus, this was missing in the original code. That was the bug, basically. Um, without this, you 
can, now this is the state machine simplified, so the left version is the good one, where's this uh, upper limit minus minus, and on the right it's missing. So without this, if you look a bit at the state machine, how you can cycle through it, and it depends only on the input, kind of on the email address, on the string, if without this u limit minus minus, you can do on the right vertical side cycles all the time, and you just apply the u limit plus plus. So you, you basically can increment this pointer uh, of the buffer indefinitely, as long as you want, and by that you can then write out of the local buffer. So you can introduce code from the string. So it's very a simple bug in a way, in hindsight, but um, it took a while kind of to find it, and also, uh, like I said, um, tools had a problem to deal with it. So why is it hard? Well, just from a naive way, I mean, it's been today said in the morning um, about if you just think of all the possibilities of the paths in a program, and this is now just saying naively uh, how this program, um, what, how many paths it exhibits. So it's about 201 loop iterations you need to trigger the bug, because the local buffer is 200 um, characters wide, and, well, to say you want to write one out of it, then it's 201 iterations. And the loop itself, the while loop, has these four if conditions, which are triggered by, this, by these different braces, and it has the last if condition, which um, decides if they should be written or not. So basically, it's about 10 different paths inside the loop, and put this together, um, it's about two to the power of 664 paths to be visited. Just kind of to find all the possible paths. And of course, some of them are, are bogus because they are uh, non-existent in reality, but it's just a rough approximation kind of the bugs. And um, that's just to find the bug. But of course, if you want to also prove the absence for the good version of the bug, you would have to go through all of possible inputs, which here is just approximated, but saying, that, okay, the string might be um, length of um, of size t, so you get to very high numbers very fast. So it's basically not tractable to say that you just brute force and look through all the parts to it. But like I said, this is anyway uh, should be known knowledge that you cannot show um, absence of bugs because uh, in, in a program just by running every possibility or every possible input because that's just not feasible. And as far as I remember, uh, it's I think it's a Wikipedia that I quote here, but. Just saying that if you count up to uh, a number kind of from 0 to 2 to the power of 256, so basically um, um, 256 bits number, you end up uh, using more energy than there is in the universe. Just because if you, I mean, there's a paper, an old paper from John von Neumann who tried to calculate how much energy you need to flip a bit. And if you just go from 0 to, to uh, 256, which is much lower than these numbers, you need more, more energy. And it's just counting. Here you would have to try every part and see the computation. So this is not just a rough picture of the complexity of this thing, but it's basically not so important because finding the bug is just finding one part, one of the buggy parts in this, in this many parts. And that can be done easy if, if done smart. And um, also tools that want to show absence of bugs, they, they uh, abstract over different parts at the same time. So basically, you, you look at a, a range of, of parts, of conditions in the program, and you can say about all of them at the same time that they are safe or they aren't. So that's the number before is kind of useless when thinking that um, program analysis works on, on different things than just the number of parts exploring them. But the problem is that if you abstract from this, um, if you use this abstraction, these smarter tools, you are also introducing some imprecision. And that might lead to false positives. And this was kind of also the, the big problem with this example that tools that could show that there's the bug, they had a warning, there might be an array out of bounds read, they showed the same for the, for the good version. So basically, they didn't show that the good version was safe, um, had no bug. So that was kind of the point of the challenge. That's what I meant, that the non version was also um, seen as vulnerable. Okay, now a very fast walkthrough um, about one um, abstraction technique, and that's now program, static program analysis with abstract interpretation. And the idea here is that you look at all the possible paths to the program at the same time, and you try to reason about them. And you do that by 
approximating them and over approximating especially because you want to be sound, which means that you, if, you, um, if there's a bug in the program, you don't want to say that there's no bug. And the precision is, is here that the important part that, I mean, you can be sound just by saying that every program has a bug, because it might have one, but you're always on the safe side, kind of saying there's a bug, there's a bug everywhere. But you want to be also um, precise enough that if there is no bug, you don't say that there's a bug. So basically, that's always the, the difficulty with, with some static analysis, too, uh, with static analysis that you want on the one side to be very precise and, and don't give useless warnings, false positives, but on the other side, you have to be sound to not say uh, miss a bug. And um, widening, the last part, is an acceleration technique and termination for termination necessary. In, and uh, I'll show you some examples of it. So don't, you don't have to look at all of this. The basic point is if you look on the left, we have uh, two variables, x and y, and they have some values there, these dots in the, in the diagram. And um, now, how can you approximate this, this set of values? One example is this using intervals. So you just put a box around them and say, the values are somehow inside this box during my program run. So this is a type of approximation. And you don't have to store all the values. You just have to store these boundaries of the box. If you want to get more precise, for example, you can have sets of intervals on the lower left. Then you have four boxes. And this red um, area, what I put there is, for example, the one you want to exclude. That that's the buggy area. So you want to say that your abstraction is not inside this area if the real program on the upper left is not inside this area. And for, as, you, as you see, the intervals and the interval sets, they have um, overlap with this red area. So they would say there's a bug, a false positive, because the real program doesn't have a bug. And uh, the last example is polyhedra. You use more complex um, geometric um, polyhedra to approximate these numbers. And that can show, for example, that there's no bug. This is just kind of to get an idea what um, abstract interpretation is. And more examples are, for example, equalities. You have, a, you have two values. You can use a, a line through them. Or you can use a grid congruences to describe different sets of values. Each of these has its uses to um, help analyze the program. OK. Now, this shows a bit what abstract interpretation does. You have these intervals that I showed before. You have arithmetics on it. You have parts to the program, if else, and the joints after the if else. And this shows kind of how the, the simulation of the program semantics, what the program does at runtime, happens on these abstractions that I showed before. So if you don't. Um, try to track all the individual values, but you say, I want to check per variable some intervals. So x would have this 1 to 102. And then you have x plus plus. Then you do the computation on these intervals. So these are just really a rough introduction to abstract interpretation to show that you have different abstractions and you compute with them. And by that, you find out what the program uh, will do. OK, and now to this widening, what I mentioned before. Well, program has have loops. So if you don't want to count or execute the loop in your analysis as many times as in the real program, and often loops also might not terminate, so your analysis might not terminate, you need some technique to speed this up and ensure termination. And that's this widening. So if we have a simple loop that goes from um, 1 to 6, and I show just the state space a bit, how it develops the x and y variables. And as you see, this line is, is continuing. And you could just do all these six steps. But it's, with widening, you can do the first two iterations. And in the third iteration, you say, OK, I see uh, there's interpolation possibly. That's one method to do widening. So I just interpolate the, the whole values that will come. But that might be imprecise because it goes much further than this six in the, in the loop head. So x will be uh, go to infinity. And then there's this technique narrowing that looks at the loop head and says, OK, I know a bit more about x. So it's not going to infinity. It's just going till uh, 6 in this case. So that's the technique to accelerate things, but also to recover this precision, the widening and narrowing. Um, here are some, some nice reads about abstract interpretation and program analysis in general. Uh, the nice introductions and showing what it, what it can, what it's able to do and where the kind of the problems are. But 
now I'll just say a bit about our own analysis. So, like I said, we managed to to um, to show the challenge that Halva had with our analyzer, and what our analyzer does is it analyzes binaries, not source code, and uh, we disassemble the executable, we translate to some intermediate language, and then apply all these abstractions I showed before and the transformers, and then we show if uh, reads or writes are inside um, the bounds of the accesses. So this is just the schematics of our analyzer. Again, we have there on the left all the different domains, which each of them captures some part of the program semantics, and they can be plugged in together or plugged out the more you have, the more complex you have, the more complex the computation, the longer it takes so, and to have the analysis. And um, that's why kind of it's built up modular that you can um, start, up, start with some analysis and if you see it's not precise enough, you can go with more complex uh, things. Okay, now back to the, to the sentiment after all this interruption of the static analysis. So now we have the code again. So, what, what needs to be done to, to show that the good version um, is safe, that it doesn't contain the bug? The important point is that we have at this right there, the third uh, green line, we have to prove that this output index um, is smaller than the buffer size. And we have to prove the same for the outer two rights. And how can we do it? Well, we need to know the value for this output index variable and we need to find uh, to know the range that can it be bigger, but unfortunately we don't know anything about the input. So the input can be completely, uh, uh, the length and the input can be unknown. They are from minus infinity to plus infinity or from zero to infinity. So we don't know anything about the input. The input is unknown. So an idea would be that with this know something about the beginning of these variables, this output index, it, it can be zero. and also down there, and we also, to widening, what happens that when you just use widening, these go to infinity again, so we again cannot say anything about their, the true range because it would be from zero to infinity, and that's outside of the buffer. So let's use some more knowledge out of the program. One knowledge is that here at the lower part, we have this threshold, or more like this if condition, that says, um, this output index should be lower than this upper limit. So we could use that. And if we are able to do this, basically the blue lines show the analysis results. We start with um, upper limit at 190 as an interval. Then we go with it down and, and uh, all the plus, plus, and minus, minus, increments and decrements change its value. But at least we have a value there and could use it for widening. Unfortunately, again, there's, um, there's the problem that we don't know anything about this upper limit, how it behaves, because all the incrementation and decrementation might happen depending on the input. So it's hard to say, or, um, to prove that it stays in bounds. But we know something about these flags. Like I said before, there's this state machine inside this loop, and this state machine is um, described by these flags these Boolean variables that show if there's a quotation or a round quote, and if we can find a relation between this upper limit uh, variable and these flags, we might be able to say that it stays in bound. And here just, again, the, how the values of this quotation and round quote behave in intervals. Um, so using widening and delaying it, we would be able to see that uh, this upper limit has a relation with these flags, and by that, it's not um, going to infinity in this program. And um, these are the, well, I showed before this long picture of our analyzer, these are the subset of domains or abstractions we used, basically these intervals, then these affine equalities are the relations between the variables, some widening strategies, um, points to, to find out where point, what pointers uh, variables are uh, pointing to, and uh, well, the rest are description of the stack, and memory and uh, CPU flex on arithmetics. So it looks complex, but um, <laughs> I hope it's at least, I mean, just interrupt me if something is completely unclear because uh, otherwise it's, it's pointless to, to <laughs> continue explaining it. So um, going back to the code. 
we start with um, first iteration and we find out that this upper limit and these flags, this quotation and run quote, they all add up to 190. That's what our analyzer just uh, proceeding the program finds out. And um, going through this, the program, we see how this values changes, but this relation is still there. That's the, the good part. So even after one iteration, we, we find out that the, there's still this relation between the flags and this variable. Now, continuing, we apply the widening, and um, okay, first widening is one run suppressed. That's the widening strategy, and again, it shows that the upper limit plus Q plus RQ is uh, 190. So th the same thing holds for the second iteration. Now the widening is applied, and we can say now after widening that output index this uh, variable is from zero to 190. So basically now we applied this acceleration. Before it was just, uh, upper limit was just uh, 188. Now suddenly we know that it can be zero in the top and it can be 190 at the bottom. And we apply this, this uh, acceleration and we find out that it's staying in this range. Continuing till the bottom, things don't change. So basically, um, the loop is stable, and that was, that was it. We wanted to show that at the bottom, that um, output index is in range, and everything's okay. So in the first version, basically the analyzer analyzed the loop four times, found these values, found that the relations between the variables hold every iteration of the loop, applied this acceleration, um, showed that the relations still hold, and found the, the bound, bounded values for this upper limit. That was, that was it, kind of basically. But Behind the, behind the scene, all these abstractions and trans transformations worked and uh, acceleration techniques and all these things. What was important again? Important was this uh, equality between upper limit and these two flags. And if we can show that this holds all the time, then we can bound the variable and we can show that the, the right is inside the bounds. And um, this narrowing that showed in the beginning would not help here. So one needs um, a more specialized widening because this, I mean, the funny thing is that the loop and the condition of the, that we need this, uh, this if, this last if, if output index is low, low in upper limit, it's at the bottom of the loop. And we need actually to, tra to transfer this condition from there to the beginning of the loop when we do this acceleration to know that it still holds. So that's why narrowing ha would have problems here because narrowing uses the loop condition, but the loop condition in this case is just saying that, uh, that this input index is uh, smaller than length and that doesn't help us anything. So that's why narrowing wouldn't help here, but some better writing strategies are um, helping. Okay, so far to this. Unfortunately, now going from this 50 lines example to the 500 lines example, uh, we cannot show it anymore that it's safe. Well, that's, that's how, how it is. Um, because the code is more complex. There's more things that happen in there, uh, in the control flow. There's uh, string functions reading from, from memory, translating string. And um, well, our abstractions, our modeling are becoming too imprecise. And suddenly we cannot show that this bounds hold anymore. And our analysis is to that, okay the um, fixed version contains a bug. So basically, we could show it in the simple example, but not in the real world bug example. So, not yet. And um, well, let's look at some other tools. So basically, after, after uh, doing this, we got with, with Harvard, okay, no, no other tool yet uh, was able to do that. And uh, the, also the, the funny thing is that we worked on the binary, not on the source code. So it was even more problematic to, to do the analysis because of, well, you have more side effects on the binary and you don't know type information. You don't, just don't have certain things that you know in the source code that hold. And um, I look, started looking then uh, on, on other tools and I even contacted some people uh, about the tools because it turned out that, and well, first of all, most of the tools are quite complicated to use, unfortunately. 
uh, but also that it's difficult to find, how to say, the best flex, the best configuration for the tool. Most of the tools require at least some knowledge from the tool maker how to use it on certain problems. But that was the nice thing that after contacting the people, it turned out that a couple of tools were able to also do the same. They either didn't try it before or, um, well, after choosing the right parameters, they were able to um, solve the problem. And like I said, one year before, it looked like none of the tools were able to do it, but now suddenly, if you start to talk with the people and they optimize or look how to apply their own tools, uh, it's possibly, uh, um, suddenly possible. And um, to mention, for example, um, some tools, this M means that they need some manual help from the tools, but were then able to show it. And um, the other ones, well, they were not able, and the techniques they used are also quite, quite um, varying, so not everything was done in abstract limitation. Some are model checking t uh, tools. Then I used, I tried um, fuzzers, and with fuzzers, well, they can show the bug quite fast. It took about 10 minutes to, to find the bug, but of course, fuzzing cannot show that there's no bug, because like I said in the beginning, fuzzing just tries all the parts. It would have to try all the parts through and say, okay, I looked through all the parts, I didn't find the bug. So with fuzzing, you can find a bug very fast, but you cannot disprove uh, that there's, there's the bug. And um, um, so it's actually quite, quite a nice result looking through these tools that things have proceeded um, since, since kind of Halvor's in, in beginning when he was thinking that, okay, it's a, a very simple knockout for all the uh, static analysis tools because it's such a simple 50 lines code and still no tool can do it automatically. So we came around and showed that, oh, it's possible and then actually found out that other tools can do it too. It just took the, the time to, uh, for the people to look into the problem. So it's, um, as, as was also in history sometimes with mathematicians, that as soon as someone said, well, the problem is solved, suddenly lots of other people can, uh, without knowing the solution, and said, yeah, I, can, uh, I discovered a solution myself. So basically, something just takes the positiveness of saying that there's a solution to this problem uh, that people then find their own solution to it. And that's, it's a nice result in a way that, that um, like I said, this challenge is from 2011 and the bug is even older. But um, now suddenly, during one year, lots of, of tool makers uh, were able to use their tools and, and show this. Well, but in general, what does it mean? I mean, for, for static analysis tools in general. I mean, the, the thing is that when we were talking first about this, with, with Halva, he, um, we were all thinking that it's quite a complex, this uh, automaton is quite a complex thing and you need very complex relations between the variables to find out how to solve it and kind of we were thinking it's a problem that will take some years that you, you get into it. But in the end, and the solutions we found shows that there's just this equality between the variables and you need to keep it and you need to do this interpolation right and um, you show that that's kind of the basic what, what the, two, the, the program writer intended when he wrote the program, that it shows that this upper limit is always below whatever the program paths go to this automaton. I mean, that was kind of the, the intention of the guy. And our tool could show it that, well, it's true what he intended on the fixed version. And um, the other part is that, unfortunately, all these static analysis tools are still quite complex. And... Um, even worse than that, I mean, besides the, the user interface, that, uh, that's why they are not adapted so, so easily in, in, in a daily code um, development. But the other thing is that when the tools themselves might have bugs. And um, whenever there's a bug, in a, like a bug in a compiler, it's quite analogous to think about it. It's also difficult to find out why and then debug the bug in this analyzer because of the complexity of this. And also because of the complexity, again, they are not used because the tools just output something that is for the developer not, not understandable. Just think of, as, like I said with compilers, just think at templates in C++ and you do have a mistake there. You get pages of output and you should find out what was my mistake in this program. So that's a bit the landscape. Currently there is good tools coming and um, that try to solve this. And I hope that it improves in the next years because it's definitely valuable. I mean, if you 
have a tool that can show you that your program or parts of your program are provable. And I'm, I'm talking about formal methods, mathematics that show that it's provable, bug free in a certain context, then it definitely helps that you don't have to run your fuzzes through this code for ages and, and try to find a bug. Okay, um, well, as like I said, if the adoption is still an uphill battle, but I hope things are, are getting better there. And um, well, let's see if we get the demo. And try not to show how anal our analyzer is working on this. Okay, it gets a bit difficult to see. For me, it's white. It's white. So, this should be this one. So, this is the compiled code of this thing that I showed before on the slides. This is now the iterations the analyzer does over the loop. And it's done. Okay, and now you'll have to bear with me reading the assembler code. So this is now the control for graph of the program in assembler. And these are the warnings we found. And as I told you, uh, they're a bit cryptical because <laughs> all the static analysis tools have to be <laughs> cryptical for the user. So, but, but the thing is that, that um, let's look for these, uh, these rights we had, these if conditions. So these are the last two ones that I mentioned before. And it shows that there's a warning with some range, some offset. But as you see, the register A EAX here goes from 0 to 191. So we had this 0 to 300 is the buffer. Uh, the 200 is the, uh, the buffer, and this AX is from 0 to 191. And before that, we find it's 0 to 190. That was before this plus plus that was done again in the, on the code. So the analyzer was able to show what we wanted. And I'll just um, this is again the disassembly in as text, and now to show that it's not just everything is staged. Let's try the bad version. I mean, you'll have to believe me that the comp compiled versions are the ones also the <laughs> that are there on the the text. And now we get a warning, and the analyzer said that it cannot find the branch instruction for the return. And that's exactly the point that the buffer overflowed or can overflow and it can overwrite the return address. And that's what the analyzer said. It cannot show that, that uh, the return address is still on the stack, that it's untouched. So that's why it's giving a warning here and showing again the code. So we have here AX, and suddenly you see it's 0 to 4 million, blah, blah, blah. it's the whole range. So now we don't have this 191 anymore, but now it's the whole uh, range of the integers we used here. So the analyzer showed that this is not in bounds anymore. So bad version, kind of, it cannot infer the, the safe thing anymore. And to show you that the things are really only differing So this is not a disassembly of both versions. There's a small change in the jumps because of the arrangement of instructions. But the important thing is here in this version, we have the sub subtraction. And here we don't have it. So that's the difference. In the, the good version, we have this upper limit minus minus, which is this subtraction here. And in the other version, it's, it's not there. I mean, that's to show that. These two versions are what I've been talking about, the good and the bad version. And um, 
to again show a bit on the complexity of analyzers. So this is now how we output <laughs> the state we know at some point. So you, you have all the nice all the variables here and you have all the possible values that the analyzer found out. You have some constraints of all the variables. You have all the ranges they might take. So that's kind of, I mean, that's now our user interface. But basically, just to show, the analyzer found for each variable at each program point possible values. And uh, it outputs them here, so you can inspect them. And, but it also gives you a warning if the values for a write are not in the range uh, of the bound, or if you would overwrite stack address, things like that. So the idea of, of the analyzer is to, to show warnings for possible bugs in programs. And uh, here we're doing it on the binary code. And that was also funny. Um, I talked with um, Pascal Kwok, and he's also here, came for the talk. Um, they also tried the um, example, and they did it on C code. And they could show different, I mean, they found some warnings that you can see on the C code, for example, that there was a missing return in this uh, function and other things that you di we didn't see on the binary anymore because the compiler changes the code. So there's also the point about static analysis or analysis in general that depending on which level in the tool chain you apply the analysis, some bugs might not be there anymore or they might be introduced by the compiler. So that's why also analyzing the whole stack of the code is an important thing and um, there is projects working on and compilers that, that uh, are um, themselves are proven correct, that they don't introduce bugs. But as stated, it's still, um, we are not there. The demo is already done. So as a last thank you to all the people that uh, helped in this and to, like I said, to whom I contacted and, and discussed about this problem, um, lots of people helped with the uh, analysis themselves the tool users, the tool writers, and um, it's an interesting thing that, but the take out of this talk that don't think at all that any of this, uh, that I'm, I'm showing that, well, these tools are better than the others. None of them are better because this is a one synthetic be benchmark. It's like saying we have a, I don't know, for loop in five different languages and which language is faster to execute this for loop. So it's basically one synthetic benchmark and there's, um, I showed a couple of tools, how they fared on this benchmark but it doesn't mean anything that any of the tools is better or worse than the other. I'm just trying to say that it was surprising how many tools actually were able to do this for an old problem, and um, that it's in a way pity that, that static analysis tools, automatic bug finding tools, are not used more in um, daily development. But on the other side is also the fault of the tool developers because making the tools in a way not usable or not yet usable enough is uh, a bit pity. And, I know um, a story of, of uh, a big rocket company from the US. They have, um, they have people working on static analysis tools next door to the developers, but the developers never use the static analysis tools in their daily development, which is a bit sad. I mean, they have a whole department working on static analysis tools, and all the other people are not, not using it. So it's a bit sad state. And I hope somehow to have given a glance a bit into this um, topic and to, I hope that also in a couple of years um, these tools are going to be used more because, like I showed with, with fuzzing, um, it's easy to find bugs, but it's very uh, difficult to, to show that there is no bugs. And, and what we want is basically showing that there is no bugs because that's why we write software. We want to write software without bugs. And <clears throat> finding bugs is just a means to it to find and fix bugs. But in the end, what we want is correct software. So, well, I hope that that uh, there's improvement in the next years. Okay. Thank you. So, in, in the true spirit of a former academic here, uh, Bogdan told me he just got his PhD, and um, seeing somebody up there with a developer saying, we want to write software without bugs, we know that he hasn't reached the corporate environment yet. <laughs> so... Good luck to you with your, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's a it's a pipe dream. <laughs> your your bitter pipe dream that's going to be destroyed when you enter the the real world yeah. and, and discover that people do write software with bugs. <laughs> it's my job to crush the dreams. Come on. <laughs> no, you, yeah, you but we're we're going to take questions. <laughs> I wanted to take the first comment though, so we have time for questions. If anybody has any questions.
It's going to be like flat. Pass the mic up. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, you, you said that three or four uh, tools could uh, detect the bug correctly, yep. the 50-line bug. Well, basically, I think all the tools could detect the bug. If you look at vulnerable version, all the tools could show that there's a bug, okay. but only some could show that there's no bug. Okay, so three or four could, could say there is no bug in the good version, but how many uh, of these could work on the 500 lines uh, code? Because you, you told us that yours couldn't work on the 500 lines code, the original, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The original well, one. Yeah, okay, now I get it. Um, well, that I didn't get to do test, but uh, I, I don't know. I would say that they are similar, that most of the tools wouldn't manage the 500 lines code either. So if the, I, I will, I will okay. probably extend on this, maybe I write a blog or something about more experience, but I, I didn't test the tools on the original. Okay. But I kind of would guess that most of them cannot do it, if there would be one, it would be great. It would be a good surprise. Okay, and just one question. D do you know of any other uh, challenges, uh, existing well, challenges well, uh, like a, this one? Yeah, well, that's a topic in itself. I mean, there is a couple of uh, benchmark or challenges, and there's the software verification challenge. And uh, I'm actually discussing with one to make a challenge for binary analysis at the moment. But... The problem with benchmark is that, like I said, with this one, it's they're synthetic, and uh, best would be to basically run on on big corpuses of real world software, but then it gets quite difficult to uh, for the analysis. I mean, analysis have a lot of problems there, and that's why it kind of the disparity between benchmarks and real world is still unfortunately big. Any more questions? Hi, uh, thanks again for your presentation. Just a very stupid question. Uh, basically, w how do you do the parsing for the semantic analysis? Uh, is it something like antler logic, or uh, did you write something up your, of your own? Uh, you, you mean the, the parsing of the semantics or, or the disassembly of the instructions? Because that's kind of two things. Correct. Uh, uh, I was speaking of the parsing. Okay. Well, that's, we implemented kind of for the, our language, like I said, I showed um, about the analyzer, we have this intermediate language, this R rail, and um, all the different architectures, x86, ARM, and others, would be uh, lifted, kind of disassembled to this intermediate language of ours, and that's some just like 20 instructions, so it's really tiny language, and for that 20 instructions, we implemented the semantics by hand, basically. That's what does this analysis. Okay, so you never actually analyze x86 code, for example. You just translate it I before translate, yeah, parsing yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. But that translation is like stateless, one to one too many translations. Yeah, so I understand that. that. That's pretty nice. Therefore, you have only a few instructions to exactly, yeah. to understand for your parser, and it's, it's yeah. a lot simpler. That was that. actually also an idea of, of Halvar in the old days. They have a similar thing, and we just continue their work with this. Okay, thank you. No, no, one too many. So one x86 interaction is about five to ten oh, yeah, of hours. Right. Yeah, so this way. But you may have something like five version of five dialects, which convert to the same ra uh, intermediate. That, uh, that too, yeah. And okay. if you, that's okay. also a nice thing that if you do, would do some compile optimizations, you could then show that the ARM code is the same in our than the x86 code. So you can do some diffing between architectures. So there's lots of interesting things there, but it's not kind of the point now of what we were doing. Okay, so I do one question. Um, on this approach, which one have been used in the uh, DARPA Sci Grand Challenge? Maybe you heard about that. Um, I just know the groups that participated there, and I think, well, I, it's, uh, I have an open browser tab on the challenge and the results, so I didn't read it yet, but <laughs> on the results, but the point is, I think that, that it was simple execution used there, and uh, I think some abstract interpretation, but I don't know the details yet because I didn't read completely. I just know the groups who participated and who. Uh, so I have only, uh, thanks for your talk. I have only one question. Um, how do you think that uh, language like Coq uh, for prov proving uh, algorithm and things like that would fit for this job? Well. It's been showed in the last three years. I don't know how the long the project, the Comcert project. Uh, uh, I mean, it's they basically did an compiler and analyzer for the compiler, 
in, in, in Coq, which does all we do, but just verified with Coq. So basically, their version is for sure uh, bug free than, than ours. So it looks like it. I was first surprised too about it. I was thinking it's an insurmountable amount of, of things you have to write, all the proofs for all the transformations and everything. And their compiler, of course, doesn't do all the fancy optimizations of GCC and, and all these things, but it, it's workable. And uh, they showed that things are right. And so it's a very interesting project. So it works. I just wanted to say it, it works. People showed it. And hi. Well, th thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question about um, you said that some, uh, sometimes it's impossible to prove that there is no bug. So when does your um, program stop seeking for a bug? You know, uh, I mean, if well, there is no way, maybe you, are, you would have to do an infinite loop. Well, I mean, somehow you, your program has to stop, not to infinite yeah. loop. Well, this proof techniques, they, they work with infinite loops at that point. You, you showed that you, you're over. You yeah. kind of just saw that, okay, they, um, you terminate in your analysis, but you then show some warnings that, okay, this loop might not terminate or something like that. This, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to explain all these things now, but, but the, the analysis, I mean, um, are designed in the way that uh, you approximate, and, but you're always on the safe side. So basically, you can show that there's a warning, there might be a bug, and you, it might be a false um, bug that it's in true, in true, in reality doesn't exist, but you never miss out a bug. This one. <laughs> so do, you, do we have like a bound? You, you say, well, um, up, up, up some, to this bound? Some tools this work bound. like this, bounded model checking or, or other tools okay. work like this that they say we do n iterations and uh, after this n iteration, uh, we could show it for the n iterations, there's no bug, we don't know after, what happens after. But our tool, for example, uh, with this acceleration technique, and there's also model checking tools that have acceleration techniques, they can say for the all possible uh, loop iterations. <laughs>